Well, greetings again. Back to Genesis, this time chapter 33, and I, I just want to, I think I want to get the passage before us and then we'll talk about it a bit. <clears throat> chapter 33 of Genesis, starting at verse 1, Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided his children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you, he asked. And Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, What do you mean by all these droves I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Please accept the present that I uh, that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted. Then Esau said, Let us be on our way. I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that children are tender and that I must care for the ewes and cows that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard just one day, all the animals will die. So let my Lord go on ahead of his servant while I move along slowly at the pace of the droves before me and that of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. Esau said, Then let me leave some of my men with you. But why do that, Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that day, Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Succoth, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Succoth. Isn't that an interesting little passage? Well, there are several things here that uh, I think... Uh, our revelation for us to filter out and and enjoy it's good good stuff you know <clears throat> every every one of us has to face our past and sometimes there's guilt sometimes there's fear sometimes there's um, uh, disappointment hurt pain of different kinds and and uh, you know the our fears and our guilt can be drivers that drive us hard. And so it may have been that both uh, Esau and Jacob had these drivers. Esau may have had a form of remorse, guilt for despising his birthright. And Jacob may have had guilt from uh, scheming and um, resting, resting the birthright from both his, his brother and his father. At any rate, a time comes when uh, You've got to be reconciled. You've got, to, you've got to face your enemies. You've got to face your past. And so Jacob is on his way back home with all that God has blessed him with, wives and children and, and lots of livestock. And he gets to this point and he looks up and there's Esau coming with his 400 men. That would be intimidating. So um, he divided his family into three groups. Isn't that an interesting thing? Was he shielding? Was he protecting? And are there layers of protection? So the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children secondly, and Rachel and her son, it's only Joseph at this point, lastly. But Esau ran to meet Jacob. Jacob had been bowing down several times as he approached, but Esau just comes running and throws his arms around Jacob and kissed him. Wow. I can imagine that at first Jacob might have had some, some fear, but 
Soon that would have been overcome with the joy of reconciliation, and it says, and they wept. Now I wonder, did Esau have a change of heart? Esau was going to kill his brother Jacob, and, uh, and Jacob knew that. And so here they are, having to face all of that stuff. Jacob was fear, and Esau apparently was just anxiety to, or just anxious to be reconciled to his brother. But I wonder if maybe Esau had had a, a change of heart. Um, could it have been in response to Jacob's prayer? Jacob had prayed in chapter 32, verse 11, for protection from his brother specifically. And uh, I, I'm thinking of a verse in 1 Peter where um, in chapter 5, verse 7, Peter quotes something from, the, from Psalm 55, 22. We know it. We, uh, in the NIV, it says, uh, cast all your anxiety on him for he cares for you. King James uses the word cares, casting all your cares on him. You know, it would be an awesome thing to finally realize that uh, your worst enemy is friendly. So Jacob came back fully afraid that Esau was out to kill him, and he was here facing uh, Esau and his 400 men. You talk about irrational fears, but this one was a rational fear. He had a reason to be afraid of his brother Esau. But Esau just seems anxious to meet his estranged brother and, and greet him joyfully. What a beautiful picture. Threw his arms around him and kissed him. <laughs> I would imagine that uh, Jacob was a little bit stiff at first, but, but uh, you know, all that stiffness, stiffness melted away and, and the joy turned to tears for, for both of them. Esau's 400 men weren't there to fight. They had come to assist in the move and to escort Jacob and his family and his possessions. However, while they were each glad to see each other, they couldn't trust each other. So they parted peacefully. Esau eventually went to uh, what was um, Edom, uh, Moab, and, uh, and then Jacob is going to settle. Jacob, now Israel, is going to settle um, back in the promised land, Bethel. He goes to a place called Succoth, and he, he sets up camp there for several years, perhaps. Esau and his descendants, on the other hand, go to Edom. Edom means red and uh, may take its name from the fact that when uh, Esau was born, he was reddish. And then, of course, the red stew that he traded his birthright for and, um, and then the land has a, a reddish hue in the mountains as well. So um, Edom, it's called. Today we know it as Moab. The uh, abhorrence of Esau towards Jacob for tricking him and giving up his uh, share of the inheritance was that abhorrence seems to have been passed on to his descendants, the, the Edomites. And the Edomites in Israel were were enemies, and they often fought. Uh, the Bible talks about how the Edomites were some of those who didn't let Israel uh, pass through Edom. And they tried to conquer the con country of Israel back in the time of Josaphat when the temple was destroyed. Didn't succeed, but they tried it. The Edomites were, were further mentioned as a nation that was defeated in the time of Saul and, and later David. They were the ones who allied with Nebuchadnezzar in the actual destruction of the temple and Jerusalem, and a pretty nasty war. They fought with the Jews many times, became one of the conquered nations during the time of the Maccabees, when it was at its peak. They, at one point under the Maccabees, were obligated to embrace Jewish culture, the men had to be circumcised, and then later they were, they were forced to follow Jewish laws. And it, it came a time when they openly uh, intermingled and, and mixed, married, intermarried with, with the Jews. But um, we find in, in uh, research that um, some of their customs may have been paganistic. 
Herod the Great was an Edomite, and uh, he was the one that built so many fortresses and seaports and cities and and the second temple, actually. Masada, several things are, are his. The kingship of, of Edomites uh, seems to have been an elective uh, process rather than just inheriting the throne from your father as, uh, as sometimes kingships do. And uh, prior to their being forced to convert to Judaism, there isn't any re a clear account, but it seems that they were pagans worshiping the deities of uh, El, Baal, Kaos, Asherah, and so on. And uh, we, know, we know a little bit about the land of the Edomites, but they fall off the page of Scripture because the Scriptures focus simply on uh, the mess Messianic line. But it's the country they went to is over there by Mount Seir, and that, uh, that comes up occasionally in the Bible. In the New Testament times, it's known as Idumea, and uh, it was previously inhabited by the Horites. The Horites seem to have been cave dwellers, and it may have been that the Edomites picked up the uh, tradition from them. And so Petra, Petra, while it is carved out uh, its tombs and memorials, there is a city of a cave city, and uh, and Petra was the headquarters of there. It was the capital city of Edom uh, at one point, or most of the time, I guess. And some of them may have been cave dwellers. Edom is a very mountainous country. And um, so during the time of Amaziah, Petra is mentioned. As, and there are other important places like their seaports called uh, down at Elath and Ezion Geber. First time I went over there, I bought my wife some mother of pearl items and some turquoise. And those came from down at Elath and Ezion Geber. I picked up a chart off of just a portion of a chart on um, on the internet here. It's available. You, we can buy these things. But I just wanted you to see that uh, as they look at the, the lifespan of Seth here, it looks like that Seth was still alive when Abraham lived and uh, may have been alive for most of Abraham's life, matter of fact. Now, I'm not sure that they knew each other or lived anywhere near each other, but it is interesting that as we build a chronology of the Bible that looks like Seth was still alive when Abraham was born. There's another chart I want us to look at here, a, a timeline of the patriarch. So here's Abraham and Sarah, and uh, then you can see their lifespan. We, we have indicated here the birth of Ishmael, and uh, not of Isaac, but uh, of Ishmael. And then um, Isaac marries Rebekah over about right here, we read about Esau and Jacob being, being born at a point about like this. And, and then you have the life of Isaac and the life of Jacob up here in blue. And uh, the time that Jacob lives in Haran is, is, you know, it's a span of time, but it seems kind of brief. And we're running the faster through these uh, patriarchs now as we get to these chapters. And then uh, you have a little time over here where Joseph is in Egypt, and it doesn't seem very long in comparison to all. There's going to be a lot of stuff that we get into, but here's here's Joseph's lifespan, and um, there's a reason why he's down in Egypt. You remember he was sold off into slavery by his brothers. So there's the there's a kind of a little chart that gives us perspective on this. One of the things that I picked up is that Moses, who apparently is the author of the book of Genesis wants to show us very clearly that while Jacob schemes and plans and uh, sometimes cheats his way along, uh, all of that really is pointless because God is at work behind the scenes and ultimately it is God who protects and blesses Jacob. And God had promised to do that. <clears throat> and the God who promised is proved faithful in these beautiful chapters of Scripture. We also had read that Jacob's nature was changed after the uh, wrestling with the angel, and so he's a different person now. But there seem to be some tendencies <coughs> that are passed on to his children. The Bible talks about how the sins of the fathers are passed on to the third and fourth generation, and this seems to be true here. And there are some, perhaps, some old habits 
that Jacob brings along with him still that need to be discipled out of him. And uh, the way he tries to appease his brother brother's anger, for instance, seems to be a little plotting and planning there and uh, dividing things up so that if he loses, he'll lose in phases or waves. And then, of course, uh, he wants to save his own skin somehow, and yet he, he takes the point. And um, he's, he's the one that goes to face Esau first. But old habits die hard, and so we, we see tinges of this along the way, and then in his children, of course, his posterity. But this passage um, is going to now begin to show us the divide between the Davidic monarchy and the nation of, Idi of Edom. So Israel is going to have a, a kingdom that rises uh, with the great King David, and then it splits into two after that, and so it's called the Davidic monarchy. And then Edom, like I say, is a great, a great nation, but it, it's off the pages of Scripture, largely. The prophets, however, speak of the enmity between these two nations, and, and it is true. They have been in it to this day. Now, uh, one of the descendants of Esau married one of the descendants of Ishmael, and it seems to have just compounded the hatred and the, um, the anger toward the Jews. And most of the Islamic world is from that lineage. And so they feel like that they are the rejected son. And, uh, and that has um, the, the union between the descendant of Ishmael, descendant of Esau, has compounded that. And that's one of the things that we're facing in what we read today in history. And frankly, I don't think there's a political solution to that, and I don't think there's going to be a military solution. Ultimately, I think God is going to have to intervene with some um, pretty big stuff. And it may have to do with end time. The end time scenario may, uh, may bring all that to a head. Anyway, just uh, thought it was worthwhile to take a look at this little passage of Scripture and think about uh, its meaning and... Um, and the history we have here as well. Thanks for joining me today, and may God continue to bless you wherever it is that you are. See ya. See you next week.